Hello, everyone. And let me get started. Okay, so my um, study, I'm just going to jump right in because I have um, a lot prepared and I'm not sure that I will get to it all, but I'm going to try my best. So um, my study is going to be on Gideon. And so the title is um, The Unlikely Hero. And this picture here is, um, it represents some of the, what will happen in the story with the torches and the um, horns or the uh, trumpet. Um, I'm not sure if anyone or maybe uh, some people know the story of Gideon from our Sunday school lessons, but hopefully um, by the end of tonight, you will know more <laughs> if you don't know the story already. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to skip this part actually. Who is Gideon? Uh, well, I wanted to say that I like, this is one of my favorite stories. This is the reason why I chose this character. Um, I'm not exactly sure why I like this story so much, but this is, it's just an exciting story to me. And as I was studying for this um, presentation, I found so much like interesting, more, I've learned about it so much more. So I thank Pastor Yvonne for even coming up with this um, deep dive study that we had to do because I've learned so much myself. Um, so Gideon is the uh, son of Joash, the uh, Bezerite. I'm not sure if I'm Please forgive me if I uh, butcher some of these uh, names and places uh, that I'm going to be saying tonight. <clears throat> uh, he was a descendant of Joseph. Um, Joseph, the colorful coat Joseph. <laughs> um, and he's from the tribe of Manasseh. He's um, Gideon is an, an Israelite. And... Um, he comes from the tribe of Manasseh. So he goes through the a name change in the story. Um, we'll get to it later. But the name change, Jerubbabel or Jerubbabel, um, it means let Baal contend or let Baal plead. He is also, Gideon is also mentioned in Hebrews 11, which is the better known as the Faith Hall of Fame. And I have a scripture here. Um, Hebrews 11, 32 through 34. And it says, and what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Japheth. Japheth? Mm -hmm. Also of uh, David and Samuel and the prophets. So these are some of the judges. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mention Gideon was a judge mm -hmm. um, in um, Israel. Uh, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, Stop the mouths of lions, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became val valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. And um, you will learn that um, Gideon, he was... Uh, when we first meet Gideon, he is basically a coward, and by the end of the story, he is a, 
um, brave soldier who um, subdued a kingdom. Mm -hmm. So this is, so when did this all happen? Um, this is a very long timeline. It starts here with the beginning of creation, Adam. Mm -hmm. And um, this is where Jesus was crucified. Um, Gideon is in this area here. And like I said before, he was one of the judges. And during the, so after um, Moses and the Israelites, um, well, not Moses, but after Joshua and the Israelites crossed into the promised land, they go through 300 years where there are different judges. They don't have a leader. So they have um, these different judges and Gideon was one of the judges. So it's like 300 years of judges. And then after that time, and that's when um, Saul appoints David, mm -hmm. which um, David is the first king. And that is where uh, Pastor Yvonne kind of on Wednesday, um, that's why I said it's kind of kind of tied together a little because I'm like right before um, the time of the kings. So that is, if you can get your mind around that time frame, it's right before the, the kings. And the, so um, Gideon was a judge for about 40 years. And this is where, we, we're gonna come back. Actually, um, this is a better map. And this shows where the army um, the routes they were gathered here. They started well. They the men came from this area. They rallied around to um, like fight with Gideon, and then they were going to attack here. And then they chased the other opposing army, the Midianites. And this red line shows the line that they chase the Midianites, the opposing army. Um, there was another group um, that they were fighting with or for them that they like teamed up <laughs> um, in Ephraim. They cut off the water supply and so this is why this red line, um, the army, the opposing army of that opposed Gideon and the Israelites, this is why this line goes this way. Because they, they cut the water off from them. And so that we'll come back to this actually if we have time. So I actually want to read um, and the um, account is from Judges 6, 7, and 8. I'm going to do mostly the reading from six and seven. Um, I don't think we will have time to get into eight. And so, um, give me one second. Okay. <clears throat> then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel because of the Midianites. The children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds, which are in the mountains. So it was whenever Israel had shown, had sown, Midianites would come up, would come up. Also, Amalekites and the people of the east would come against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts, both they and their camels, 
were without number, and they would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried to the Lord. So I, um, you can see um, they are being oppressed by the Midianites. Mm -hmm. What I want to say is this is um, the, the Midianites, where, where they were dwelling, they should have been driven out of this land. They should not have been there. Um, God had instructed the Israelites to drive out all of the, um, to drive out everyone from the land so that this particular, so that this wouldn't happen, so that they wouldn't be um, anyone there to um, oppress them. And so because they didn't do that, this is what happened. The Midianites um, came against them. So, and it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up out, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. Also, I said to you, I am your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. And so right here, but you have not obeyed my voice meaning you didn't drive out all of, you didn't drive out everyone, like I told you to. Also, mm -hmm. you are now doing the things that Midianites are doing, which are um, the Midianites worship Baal. And so now the children of Israel or the Israelites have begun to worship Baal and Asherah. And so now we meet Gideon. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terra, the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizarite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Okay, so this is a lot going on right now. <laughs> the first thing I want to say is the angel of the Lord, that is actually God himself. Mm -hmm. um, we know this because of um, the things that will happen later on in the scriptures. It's not just um, a regular angel. We know that there there's a difference between um, angels that have a message from God, but then there's also um, the angel of the Lord, which is God. And we know that it's the angel, uh, it's God because He allows um, Gideon to sacrifice to Him and worship Him. The other angels, whenever someone tries to worship an angel, they say, don't worship me. Um, so we know that it is God himself. Um, also, we see Gideon, he is threshing wheat in the wine press. And he's hiding, actually. That's not where you thresh wheat. You thresh wheat on the threshing floor. <laughs> so um, that's not good. So he, he's hiding because he's scared of the many. Midianites. So I'm going to proceed. Okay. Um, verse 13. Gideon said to the Lord, Oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. 
So there goes Gideon. He's questioning God. He, this comes up a lot, actually, throughout this story. He he always is questioning and um, doubtful and unsure. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? And verse 14, I thought this was so interesting um, that I wanted to, the, this part here, have I not sent you? Mm -hmm. It's not, uh, he didn't exactly send Gideon. Oh, well, he did, but how he sent him is through Joshua, um, Joshua 1, 9. And um, this says, um, have I not commanded you be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Yeah. And I just thought that was so good. And like this, if you guys have um, time, I really, um, you should read this story. And I feel like this, um, this story, it has like a lot of hidden gems like that. Like yeah. it's, a lot of um you can go so deep into the story that's why i i enjoy this story um so verse 15 so he said to him oh my lord how can i save israel indeed my clan is the weakest in manasseh and i am the least in my father's house and the lord said to him surely i will be with you and you shall defeat the midianites as one man then he said to him if now i have found favor in your sight then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me do not depart from here i pray until i come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you and he said god that is i will wait until you come back and so then um gideon proceeds to offer um, the angel of the Lord, a sacrifice, but we're going to skip over that because we don't have a lot of time. And so then we're going to skip down to verse 25. Now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him. So now that um, this is uh, Gideon's mission, this is the reason why God showed up. Um, Take your father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement, and take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. So Gideon took 10 men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. So he destroyed the um, altar, did everything, um, we're going to skip over this part. This is where his name changes to Jerubbabel, which means um, let Baal plead against him. His dad comes to his um, like defense and says, um, uh, "Would you plead for Baal?" Like so, if if yeah, let me just read it. The, so the um, the men of the city got upset because um, Gideon destroyed the idol. So they say, bring out your son that he may die because he has torn down the altar of Baal and because he has cut down the wooden image that was beside it. But Joash, that's Gideon's dad, said to all who stood against him, would you plead for Baal? Would you? Would you save him? Let the one who would plead 
for him be put to death by morning. If he is a God, let him plead for himself because his altar has been torn down. And so um, that happens. And then we're going to move on. This is like the most, um, if you know the story of Gideon, you probably, this is the part that you probably know. Please. So Gideon said to God, um, if you, so here goes Gideon questioning God again, okay? <laughs> um, if you will save Israel by my hand, as you have said, look, I shall put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor. If there is dew on the fleece only, and it is dry on the ground, then I shall know that you will save Israel by my hand. And you have said, and it was so. So God did it. When he rose early the next morning and squeezed the fleece together, he wrung out the dew. He wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Then Gideon said to God, oh, don't be angry with me, but let me speak just one more time. <laughs> let me test, I pray. Just one more with the fleece. Please, Lord. <laughs> let it now be dry only on the fleece, but on the ground let there be dew. And God said, and God did so that night. It was dry on the fleece only, but there was dew on the ground. So God showed him both things that he needed to see. He showed him the wet fleece and the dry fleece. I just thought that, that that's so interesting, but that's just like us in our own <laughs> like uncertainty. Um, okay, and so now I wanted to skip to um, Gideon choosing or Gideon actually fighting. So, and the Lord said to Gideon, the, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. So, I did, so God told um Gideon it's too many of y'all it's not even a lot actually it, <laughs> it's not a lot of well, let me let me read verse three now right. therefore proclaim in the hearing of the people saying whoever is fearful and afraid let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead and 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained so from that math, we knew that there were 32,000 men all together that came and 22 uh, left, 22,000 men left. So Gideon is left with 10,000 men. And you think that's <laughs> that, so he, he left with 10,000 men. And then the Lord says, there's still too many. <laughs> the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. Oh, I wanted to make sure um, that I emphasize that the reason why there are too many is because God does not want Israel to claim glory for itself. He wants Israel to understand it is me, God, who is saving Israel. It's not you guys. So yeah, we're gonna have to stand it's it's me. And so um I'm going to skip down because we are short on time, but I really um, please go back and read this story um, in more detail. Um, what I want to point out here was, oh no, wait, I need to, I need to read this part actually. 
Oh, no. So I can say um, that God. Uh, no, let me just read. The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. And uh, so let me show you, I have a picture so that you guys can understand better. So these are the two, so they, you can drink water like on your hands and knees this way or bring it up to your mouth this way. And so the test, God is going to um, tell, instruct Gideon, okay, um, this one should go, this one should not go, this one should go, this one should not go. Uh, okay so and the number of those who lap putting their hand to their mouth was 300 men but all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water then the lord said to gideon by the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his place. So what happened here is God said, you're going to get 300 men, Gideon, and that's who's going to go into battle with you. And and so they go into battle and they, um, I'm not going to go through all of this. Uh, I'm going to show you this picture again. Um, that picture. But they surrounded the, um, men and they blew horns and they uh lit the uh a lamp this confused the enemy and the enemy actually turned on um each other and so the 300 men in gideon they didn't even need to fight the other men they just blew the horns. Uh, when the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. And the army fled to Beth Acadia toward the rock as far as the border of Abel, Mehola by Tabor. And so they pursued. Um, what happened is they actually came uh, or killed or captured um, two princes, Oreb and Zeb. So they killed the two princes. And in chapter eight, they tracked down the two kings. They killed the two kings. And then the last part that I wanted to cover, which um, this is a part that I've never, I've read this story many times, but I didn't, I've never seen this part before. <laughs> Gideon's ephod. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we started the story by Gideon tearing down an altar. But what's interesting is at the end of the story, Gideon set up an altar himself. And I, I'm not sure if uh, we don't know his intention. I don't think that it was a bad intention, but this is what happens. Um, so because they won this battle, um, Israel, um, they said, but Gideon's, uh, no, I'm sorry. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson also. For you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. So if I haven't, if I weren't clear, they won the battle. Israel has won. They are free from the Midianites. Yay. <laughs> okay. Um, and Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. So he was, that is very righteous of Gideon. He doesn't want to be a king over them. Great. That's so good. Then Gideon said to them, I would like to make a request of you. <laughs> and this is not, not a good thing, that each of you would give me the earrings from his plunder. So he takes the gold um, earrings. He takes um, crescent ornaments, pennants, the purple robes from the kings. And then he makes an um, then Gideon made it into an ephod or an idol and set it up in his city, Ophrah. Mm -hmm. And all Israel played the harlot with it there. Mm -hmm. So they, that's not good. And mm -hmm. it became a snare or a trap um, to Gideon and to his house. So that is not very good. And all of the years that I've read that story, I never knew that that's what happened. Um, that he started the story by taking an idol or destroying an idol. But in the end, he actually set up an idol himself. And Israel, uh, while he was alive, Israel was okay. Um, but soon as Israel, soon as Gideon died, so it was as soon as Gideon was dead that the children of Israel again played the harlots with the bells, Baals, and made ba Baal bereft their God. Thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God, who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. Nor did they show kindness to the house of Gideon in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. So after all of that, they went right back to um, worshiping Baal again. And so the things that I wanted, there's two things that I wanted um, to come away from this uh, okay so the first one is this number one um what in the the two questions that i wanted everyone to ask themselves like how can, what can we take from the story what in um my life needs to be downsized so gideon didn't need to worry about the process of eliminating the men that needed to go god took care of that part for him actually um Gideon didn't have to try to uh, think of a process or come up with a system of eliminating the men all he had to do was be obedient and follow the directions that God gave him and it will work out for him um because in verse uh in Judges 7 4 the people are still too many bring them down to the water, and I, God, will test them for you there. So he was going to work out everything for him. And so um, 
there may need to be some downsizing in our lives that need to take place for us to be used by God. But, um, and God doesn't want to share his glory. So once we remove those things that eliminate all doubt of us taking credit, then God can move freely. And the second thing is, um, this is the biggest takeaway that I took from um, the story of Gideon, which it probably doesn't make sense to a lot of people, but I just, like, God was so patient with Gideon um, because uh, I feel like Gideon was... He needed a lot of assurance and God was just, every time he needed that assurance, God would get it to him. And so the question is, how patient are you? Could you be more patient with those around you? In this story, God was patient with Gideon. He didn't say, why do you keep asking me questions? Don't, why don't you just do what I told you to do? <laughs> Instead, he always encouraged Gideon and gave him exactly what he needed to be successful. And God is the same with us. He is patient with us as well. Um, and we should be a reflection of him and be patient with others. And if God can be patient with us, then why can't or can't we be patient with him? So can't we wait on him? Um, and so then my closing scripture is uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. Um, love suffers long and is kind. Love doesn't envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And that's all <laughs> I have. Um, are there any questions? There's so much more that I would like to share, but <laughs> we don't have time. <laughs> are there um, any questions? Like I said, when you get into Gideon, and Gideon is such uh, an exciting book until uh, to do real justice, you do need uh, quite a bit more time, but you gave it, uh, you gave us a very good overview. Looks like uh, Beanie has a question. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Auntie Beanie? Yeah, these, pe these people, uh, they sure like to worship idols. <laughs> Baal, that is a cow, yes. a bull. Mm hmm. Yep. Well, what was yes. the dog? You know, because they like they like dogs back in that time too, didn't they? Yeah, they worship anything could be. Baal was the was the bull. Yes. Oh. Okay. Uh, I actually the, had a question for Pastor Sam. Um, did Baal um was was it also uh like a sun god also in that represented Baal or no? Your 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 mic is not open. Your mic needs to be open, Pastor Sam. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, Baal represent a lot of different gods in that sense. You yeah. know. Okay. When they just because use that term Baal, it could cover a, a lot of territory. And you know, sun god, okay. all kinds of gods, all kind of false gods. When they say uh, the Hebrew, sometimes would say we represent the Baal. They they put an S on it. And then that would say all the different, you know, false God that our God told the Hebrew people to stay away from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Anyone else? Any, of course, my best uh, part with Gideon is all of the pleases that he put out for God, you know, and yeah. is like a <laughs> test. Okay, God, can you make yeah. this happen? Can you make this happen? Now, let God, me, in, in, in defense of Gideon, make it, God would in, make it happen. In defense of Gideon, Gideon didn't have the Bible, and he was not a trained theologian in that. You know, he was just a regular person that God used. 
Okay, yeah. let me. And so he didn't have the New Testament, the Old Testament, and the sense the way we got it, understanding that God, you know, he just had start started to work. He was kind of an apprentice there, you know, and mm -hmm. so he just wanted to make sure that he was doing things right. In a sense. Yeah. God knew his heart that he was a gentle and righteous man. That's why God used, you know, Gideon to do what he did at that time. People you know? still use fleeces today. Right. So we have the Bible. <laughs> if, you, if, you do, if you use a fleece today, then that's a little bit like a faith there, you know. Well, yeah. Because we right. have the word of God. Exactly. Jesus came to do away with the feces and that, you know. There's a lot of lack of faith and a lot mm -hmm. of fleeces that go up. But that's one of my favorite part in, in, his, in the uh, the the way God chose and eliminated all of the the soldiers mm -hmm. uh, by the lapping or the putting the two the hands up to the mouth, you know, he could tell the ones who were really, you know, looking out um, to I, see I what wondered, was going on. I, <laughs> I wondered, like, um, or because it doesn't say why he chose the three hundred. Um, well, the like, three hundred was. Yeah, yeah, the way that they were standing, the position. The position was, you know, they were like the ones that was laughing with one hand. If you think about it, if you dip your hand down in, a, in the water, in the lake, and put mm -hmm. it up to your mouth, you're like got one side of your body available to look around. The mm -hmm. ones that got all the way down on all fours, and all the way almost in the water, they could not see, you know, what was going on around them. So the ones mm -hmm. that lapped with one hand was more mm -hmm. aware of what, mm -hmm. you know, the, the armies around them, the uh, the enemies around them. So he kind of eliminated them by by looking at that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that they, all they were more alert. I, I would alert. say they were more alert. Uh-huh. They were alert. Yeah. The yeah, I had my mic, my, again. but even though they did not have to fight, they still got chose them because they was more alert and willing to do what was right. Kind of like a military training, you know, boot camp. Always be aware. Who to Always send be. here, who to send there by the actions that they're taking in that sense. I also, that, that, um, I'm sorry, but the, the, like the winnowing down of that, I looked at that, like, you can just go so far or so deep into that also like how um when i when i read that i thought about um how um in john when jesus uh was teaching and some of the disciples turned away like mm -hmm. um that was a hard teaching and so then that's when some of the disciples like oh well Got to yeah, part depart with you here, Jesus. Can't do that. <laughs> I can't do that one. Like, cannot you know, do. Cannot yeah. do. Okay, well, that was really, really good. Thank you so much. I, I know that you are very, very thorough. Uh, of course, you, you are a trained teacher, but uh, that was <laughs> uh, and and you know and and uh, when you're really interested, that's one of your favorite books and one of your favorite people. Mm -hmm. So you will tend to put all you have into it and in, in what you did. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now we'll just turn it over to Sister Linda. And Sister Linda, I think she's going to do that report. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Mine is going to be just reading today. I didn't do a presentation like uh, the beautiful one that Sharina did. But, and it's on Deborah. And again, like Gideon, Deborah um, is a powerful woman in this Bible. Deborah is ranked among the most famous women on, of the Hebrew Bible known to Christians in the Old Testament. Not only known for her wisdom, but Deborah was also known for her courage. And she is the only woman of the Hebrew Bible who gained status on her own merit not because of her relationship to a man. She was truly remarkable and she was a remarkable woman. Um, uh, she was a remarkable woman. She was a judge. She was a military strategist, a poet and a prophet. 
Deborah was one of four women designated as prophets in the Hebrew Bible. And further down in this uh, lesson, I'm gonna, I'll tell you who those other women were. And as much she was said to transmit the word and the will of God. Although Deborah wasn't a priestess who offered sacrifices, she did lead public worship services. And Deborah was one of the rulers of the Israelites prior to the monarchy period that began with Saul circa 1047 BCE. These rulers were called misfits, judges, uh, an office that traced back to a time when Moses appointed assistants to help him resolve disputes among the Hebrews. That's in Exodus 18. Their practice was to seek guidance from God through prayer and meditation before making a ruling. And therefore, many of the judges also were considered prophets who spoke a word from the Lord. And Deborah lived somewhere around 1150 BCE, about a century or so after the Hebrews had entered Canaan. So who was Deborah in the Bible? As I said, Deborah is one of the most influential women of the Bible. As a prophet, Judge Deborah was said to hear God's voice and share God's word with others. As a priestess, she did not offer sacrifices, as I said, as the men did, but she did lead worship services and preach. She is known for her wisdom and courage and is the only woman in the Old Testament who is known for her own faith and actions, not because of her relationship with her husband or any other men. As a prophet, Judge Deborah was said to hear God's voice and share God's word with others. As a priestess, she did not offer any sacrifices at all. So Deborah was one of the judges of Israel during a time of oppression. She is called a prophetess and the wife of Lapidoth. The Lord spoke through her as she uh, held court under a tree, the palm of Deborah in Ephraim. The Lord also used her to set her people free and defeat the king of Canaan. Yeah, she was in the military. She well, it was not necessarily military, but it was a battle that she was in. Deborah's story is found in Judges 4 and 5. Um, when Deborah became judge, the Israelites had been subjugated, which means to bring under control or to make submissive uh, master or enslave for 20 years by Jabin, king of Canaan. The commanders of Jabin's army was named Sisera and he had 900 iron chariots, formidable weapons against Israel's foot soldiers. That's in Judges 4.3. The Israelites were treated very cruelly by Caesarea and his army, and Israel's spirits was very low. Deborah describes the hardships of the living under Jabin and Caesarea this way. She said, the highways were abandoned and the travelers kept to the byways. The villagers ceased in Israel. They cease to be. That's in Judges 5, 6, and 7. In other words, people feared to leave their homes, traveling very dangerous. Traveling was very dangerous. God's word came through Deborah to a man named Naphtali, named Barak. Uh, the message is that he will lead the revolt against Caesarea. So who is Caesarea? Caesarea in Judges 4 and 5 was the captain of the army under Jabin, the Canaanite king of Hazor. Barak responded by saying, if you go with me, I will go. If not, I will not go. That's in Judges uh, 4 verse 8. And in the next verse, Deborah agrees to go to battle with Barak and the troops, but, sh but share with him. However, is what she said. However, there will be, <clears throat> excuse me, However, there will be no glory for you in the course you are taking. For then the Lord will deliver Caesarea into the hands of a woman. And that's in Judges 4, 9. Judge and warrior Deborah went off to battle with Barak. And as foretold in prophecy, Caesarea fell at the hands of a woman, but not Deborah. Rather, it was Jael, the wife of a clan leader, who would avenge the Israelites by driving a tent peg through Caesarea's head with the mallet when he was asked when he asked for a water and respite. 
we, he was actually he had wanted water to get some rest, and she drove that tent peg through his head. The Israelites came against the army of Caesarea, and God granted the victory, as um, Deborah told. The mighty Caesarea himself was brought down by the hands of a woman, just as Deborah had said, as the commander rested after a battle. Who was Deborah in the Bible? We can see that God's power is what matters, regardless of the instrument he chooses to use. Man or woman, strong or weak, confident or hesitant. All are strong when they are moved by God's spirit and filled with his strength. We can see also in Deborah's a picture of God's tender care for his people. As a mother cares for her children, so Deborah led and nurtured Israel. And that's in Judges uh, 5, verse 7. Now, facts about Deborah in the Bible, her story is told in both Judges 4 and 5. And Deborah has an impressive resume of judge, warrior, poet, and a prophet, as well as a singer and a songwriter. She was the only, she was um, only one of five women described as a prophet in the Old Testament. Remember, I told you a little bit ago that I would tell you who they were. The other four are Miriam. Huldah, and that's in 2 Kings 22, verse 14, and 2 Chronicles 34, verse 22. And Odiah, that's in Nehemiah 14, and the prophetess is in Isaiah 8, 3. The only other person in the Bible who was said to be both prophet and judge was Samuel. Deborah is the only female judge mentioned in the Bible. Deborah the judge. Judge Deborah was one of the rulers of the Hebrews and the only female leader we know in the Old Testament. These rulers were called misfits, which is translated as a judge. The role originated back when Moses appointed helpers, as I said, to assist him in solving arguments among the people. Deborah would sit under a palm tree between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites will line up for her to rule on a matter. So in Judges 5, we read Judge, Judge Deborah's story again, but this time as a poem. This chapter in scripture, often referred to as the Song of Deborah, is believed to be written as early as the 12th century BC. And it's considered by many biblical scholars as one of the examples of Hebrew poetry. This poetry celebrates the Hebrew victory over the Canaanites and Caesarea's army. It's, it goes something like this. Wake up, wake up, Deborah. Wake up, wake up, break out in song. Arise, Barak, and take captive your captives. Son of Abunim, the remnant of the nobles came down. The people of the Lord came down to me against the mighty. So may all your enemies perish, Lord but may all who love you be like the sun when it rises in strength. And that's in Judges 5, uh, verse 12 through 13 and 31. So why is Deborah important in the Bible? In the song Deborah composed after the battle, she gives us an incredible insight as to what happened when God awakened her from her comfortable existence. And she exclaims in that uh, we just read, Awake, awake, Deborah. With all the turmoil in the world these days, we can relate to Deborah as a role model who lived in troubled times. After 20 years of oppression, while most of her people cowered in fear, God awakened her in a zeal to do something. As Deborah awoke, she arose as a leader to awaken others to stand up and fight. When leaders lead, others will follow. And it goes back to us, Pastor Sam and Pastor Yvonne, always telling us to go out and share the gospel. Go out and share God's word with you. Because sometimes when you share with people, they are, right now, people are looking for some hope. They are looking for something good. And when you come up with something good about God's word, people will listen. And they will get inspired. To me, they would. They would get inspired and go out and share the word of God. So it, 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 we need to stand up and fight for our country as Christians so that they don't, they don't take away our rights. And they're trying to. 
And as it says, when leaders lead, when we go out and share, others will follow, which means others will do the same. Think of it on an ordinary day, the Lord's awakened Deborah to take action that will require courage and faith. Could today be the ordinary day that God is waking you from a slumber to do through you more than ever dreamed of or imagined for his kingdom and glory? Don't shrink back and think that God uses other people or uses people. Be inspired to realize that God uses ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary things. And he wants to awaken you to do all that he has planned for you. The Apostle Paul said, you became followers of us and the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all who believe in 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, and 7. Paul led by an example. And in those, and in turn, those who became followers became examples to others. See how that works? When leaders lead, as I said, others will follow. Realize that God didn't save you so you could live comfortably until one day you go to heaven. He saved you to lead others to follow Christ. Before the foundation of this world, God prepares specific plans he wants to accomplish through your obedient life, your life. So is God calling you or how is God calling you? In Hebrews 11, recognizes God's heroes of the faith, which incidentally included Barak. The heroes recorded were simply ordinary people who raised, who got raised up in their generation. Reading their stories inspires me to wake up to do whatever God wants to do through my life, in my time. How about you? After the author of Hebrews celebrate God's heroes, he inspires us to awake from our own apathy. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. That's Hebrews 12, 1. The same God who inspired Deborah is calling you to arise and do his will. And when God calls you to his purpose, he will give you the action to go forth. Consider Philippians 2.13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasures. God doesn't expect you to come up with what you'd like to do for him. Instead, he puts within you an irresistible desire to do those he planned for you. And then if you pay attention, you'll see God's giving you opportunities to do those things. Consider this quote. The more we use the means and opportunities we have, the more will our ability and opportunities be increased. Deborah is a role model of one who woke up and took action as she accomplished her everyday task as a judge. God called Deborah to increase opportunities to lead others to wake up and serve the Lord. Consider your own life. Have you pondered how God might be calling you to wake up to lead others toward righteousness? If you're a parent, it's easy to lose sight of the value of God placed on your everyday task of parenting. What kind of legacy are you leaving? In Psalms 127, three through five, helps provide some perspective. Children are a heritage from the Lord. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has quiver, who has, uh, who has his quiver full of them. Have you viewed your children as arrows? Your child is an arrow you keep in your quiver for a short time. While he is entrusted to you, you must lead him to wake up to shoot straight and true when he is ready to be launched toward the targets of God's purpose for his life. In its history, the influence of mothers and fathers has shaped nations, trained leaders, and nurtured uh, artists, and encouraged ordinary men and women to accomplish extraordinary feats. This is your time in history. 
whether you're a man or a woman, mother or not, in the same way that God used Deborah in her generation, he's calling you to arise and courageously lead others to fight in God's army. The God of this world, Satan, is blinding the eyes of people. It's time to wake up and realize that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities of darkness who came to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's in Ephesians 6, 12 and John 10, 10. Deborah's final legacy reads, so the land rested for 40 years in Judges 5, 31. Her courageous life brought peace to the people. Today, the way to peace is found in leading people to Christ and stirring in Christians to do the same. Let this be your legacy. The battle belongs to the Lord. The captain of the host is Jesus, and he is the one who will give you courage to lead. Because when leaders lead, as I said, others will follow. So what can we learn from Deborah's story? Deborah and her story can teach us so much, but there are three lessons we can all learn from. The first one, to be obedient. If God is telling you to do something or go somewhere, despite your fears, listen to his call. And when you think about it, when God calls us to do something and we listen and are obedient, we know if we love the Lord and we know God, we know that God's not going to send us somewhere unprotected. He's going to always be there with us. So if, if you hear God, and he tells you to do something, do it. In spite of being scared, you know, when you start doing something, if you're doing something for the first time, you have fear. But the more you do it, the less fear you have. The more you learn and love the Lord, the less fear you have when he calls you to do something. He has plans that we cannot begin to understand and hearts and lives uh, may, I'm sorry, hearts and lives may be changed by our obedience. And the second one is to be courageous. The old saying, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called applies here. Doing something out of your comfort zone to glorify him can be terrifying, but faith was never promised to be easy. And I'm going to say that one again, but faith was never promised to be easy. Be bold, be courageous for his glory. And the third one is to stand true. Never waver in your faith. We may not always know what the road ahead will look like. But we only need to remember that God will faithfully guide us and lead the way, just as he did with Deborah. And that's the end of my presentation. Amen. Amen. I like Deborah, too. Deborah was great. Yes. Yes. Any questions? Very nice. Very good. Mm -hmm. Huh? Yes. That was, very that was very detailed uh, presentation. Thank you, Sister Linda. You're welcome. I liked it because she was also a judge, and she was like this the person that everybody came to when they had problems. You know, it's like the mother. When the children has problems, they go to the mother. That's what Deborah was to the people. Mm -hmm. She could sit under her tree and judge the people and make decisions they would come to her for uh you know decision making and um, she was more than qualified yeah. mm -hmm. god qualifies you and I'm, I'm glad you uh, added that at the end he qualifies the people that he calls you know somebody's phone i don't know is that yours no it's not mine it's a oh, no i don't my phone isn't on Okay, went away, whatever it was. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that was very, very good. Two, yes. two, two good. very good presentations. Yeah. We got a few minutes. And uh, so I have a uh, little trivia. Mm -hmm. uh, well, before you pass you on, I'm sorry. I wanted to answer. Serena had another question about her. Is when she said uh, Gideon built another altar. 
the altar that he built was to the Lord there. I wanted to answer that question. I forgot to answer that question also when I was answering questions. Gideon's last altar that he built was an altar to God, the Holy God, a good altar there. Okay. Mm -hmm. We just wanted to do, I wanted, to, that was kind of, like, to get that, Sorry. that was, yeah, he didn't build a false God altar. It was a very good altar. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. well, I got a little uh, trivia here in uh, Testy's brains. Um, you questions. So I'll tell you what, um, why don't, as we go through these questions, if you know the answer, just call it out. I was going to have everybody just write them down, then we'll go back, but uh, just uh, we'll do it this way. We'll do it the easy way. All right. In the old is the Old Testament bigger than the New Testament? These are so easy. <laughs> yeah. It's bigger. Yes. <laughs> All right. Now I have a follow-up question. How many books are in the Old Testament and how many are in the New Testament? 39 and 27. Oh, all right. Okay. All right. So 39 and 27. Okay. The Old Testament was written in which language? Hebrew. <laughs> All right. All right. That is correct, Miss Tara. Uh, what's the final book of the Old Testament called? Hmm. Melly. What's, what's the, you got it, Pastor Sam? Yeah, I'll let somebody else walk that. Malachi. Okay. Malachi, right. Yes. Mm -hmm. What is the first of the Ten Commandments? What we just been talking about all the time. Well, let's either answer it. Or I ain't it. gonna answer. I ain't gonna answer. Okay. <laughs> Anybody know? Is it thou shalt not serve another guy? I'll put another guy before me. Exactly. Amen. Thou shalt not have. Any other gods before me? Oh, God hates that, yes. All right. Benjamin was the youngest son of which person from the Old Testament? Uh, uh, Jacob. Yep. Yep. Jacob. <laughs> okay. Uh, what was God's promise to never send a flood connected to? What what symbol? Somebody's trying to take it away from us. Rainbow. 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 Right. How were sins forgiven in the Old Testament? What did you have to do? Bring a sacrifice. Okay. Once a year. To the. To the, to high, the high priest. priest. Yes, yep. the priest. Animal sacrifices. Okay. Um, there had to be shedding of blood. So that's why it was, it was um, for your uh, sins, you had to take the animal sacrifices to the high priest. Um, who was assigned to make a sacrifice in behalf, I should have said, on behalf of all Israel during the Old Testament time? We basically just said it. Yeah. The high priest was the yeah. only one that could go into the Holy of Holies. Amen. Little Candace. Okay. What, uh, kind of, what kind of animal did they use for that? Uh -huh. Oh. Oh, goodness. The animals couldn't be. They had to have a certain kind of fat on the right. Yeah. Mm. The animal without certain spot or wrinkle, and at one point, defects. Mm -hmm. Defects. Okay. Mm -hmm. How did God appear to Moses in the wilderness? A burning bush. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All right. Okay. What was the secret behind Samson's great strength? His hair. What about his hair? 
It was long. <laughs> he never could. He never could. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I say that again, Cam. Oh, he Cam. never cut it. Right. He, he didn't his, put a razor to his head. Right. He could never shave or cut his hair. But we know what happened, don't we? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> who are the religious leaders who constantly try to trap Jesus with their questions? What what group was this? Roman. They were sad, you see. Oh. Oh, that's Jesus. <laughs> the Sadducees and Pharisees. 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 Yeah. Uh, what are the four Gospels in the New Testament called? What are the names of the four Gospels? Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. Amen. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, what are Paul's letters called that he wrote? The ones in the New Testament. Epistles. Epistles. Uh, specifically, uh -uh. specifically, what what are Paul's letters called? It's epistles, but there's another name associated with them. You remember? No, I can't. I can't Pauline remember. Epistles. Pauline epistles, right? From his name, the Pauline epistles. Uh, in which New Testament book does Jesus say, I and my father are one? Remember that? Which book? Would it be John? Yep. <laughs> Many of the New Testament letters to the church were written by who? Just uh, this is Paul. Yeah, yep. I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah, Paul wrote about what uh, uh, three fourths of the New Testament. Okay, uh, which New Testament book gives the most accounts of Jesus's miracles? Any guess, John? Nah. Luke. Nah. <laughs> Process of elimination. Must be Matthew. <laughs> nope. It's One not book. Matthew. Mark. 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 <laughs> Mark has more accounts of uh, his miracles. Uh, who went on missionary journeys to preach to the Gentiles? Who was assigned to preach to the Gentiles? Paul? Uh -huh. Wait a minute, who said that? I did. Yeah, Paul. That was his calling, to preach to the Gentiles. Um... What was Matthew's profession? Possibly tax collector. The tax collector, right? Mm -hmm. Why everybody loved him, right? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> <laughs> every time, every time they saw him, he wanted money. Okay, according to the Gospels, what's the unique? Uh, literary gentry uh, Jesus uses to preach his message. What type or form did he use? We, we call them. Is it parables? Parables. Parables. Right. <laughs> parables. Anybody want to explain uh, what a, a good definition of a parable is? An earthly uh, more understandable. 
Yeah, uh, a heavenly thing described as something on earth that we can understand. Okay. Using, more yeah, using earthly things, items, heavenly things to help us to understand heavenly, the spiritual side, mm -hmm. the spiritual side. Right. All right, and then uh, this is the last one. Who was the blind person Jesus healed? Anybody remember his name? Mm -hmm. Blind. Barton. Barton. That I almost said it was a virus. Starts with a B. Barnabas. 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 Well, what about Barnabas? It was Bart somebody. Oh, Bartimaeus. Mm -hmm. Barnabas. Mm -hmm. Oh, you from Southeast Missouri. All righty. So that was good. You guys did good. I like to throw in a little trivia every once in a while. Who has a, uh, we got one more minute. Who has a good trivia question? This is called Stump, Stump Your Friend. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Who has a good trivia question? A gal that's a galaxy A54 5G is talking. No, I'm I was thinking. <laughs> oh uh, okay. And no trivia questions. Okay. It's not a trivia question, but it uh name three names, other names for Jesus. <laughs> three other names for you mean like savior or God or Yes, yes, that's two. Oh, that's a whole bunch of that. Okay, Savior, <laughs> God, soon coming King, Son of Man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh, kings, Lord of Lords. All of, them will be names. All of the all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> all of the above. Very good, Beanie. Very good. True or false? The Bible is the most popular book ever written. True. True. Right. Still, yes. And it's still the most or the best sold book uh, in the world today. Okay, and this is going to be our last one. I, I just like asking questions. Uh, who were the three sons of um, Adam and Eve? The three sons of Adam and Eve. Was it Cain and Abel? Abel. And I don't know the third one. Cain, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Abel, and who? Seth. Seth? Right. Cain, no. Cain, Abel, and Seth came along like that. Right. Very good, guys. It was good. So I want to thank, uh, thank again um, Sharina and Linda tonight and all the other uh, presenters that we've had over the last few weeks and all of the good presentations they were all great and uh, we'll Very do it good. again so, yeah do it again sometimes I like to do that mm -hmm. um, it helps whoever is preparing it it just helps you to dig a little bit deeper and um, and like Sharina and Linda both I, I believe said that you know, the more you read, the more information you get, and you got to cut it off somewhere, you know, but um, uh, you look at one scripture about your person, and it leads to something else that you can add to it to help us to understand, and it leads to something else, leads to something else, so, um, you know, that's how you learn and um, memorize a lot of things in the Bible, where they are, uh, people in the Bible, how how they are, they are connected, 
to one another. Um, the time periods that, that uh, we have all of the different dispensations and how God used different types of people like the judges and uh, the kings, uh, the patriarchs. Before any of that, you have the patriarchs like Moses and Abraham and all of the people back there. And then, you know, people wanted wanted somebody to lead them like the like the uh, gentile nations like the uh nations around them you know god really meant for them to just listen to him directions but they wanted somebody around them like all of the other nations so that's when he began to um, put in place uh kings and leaders judges uh and you know and you go through these different time periods like that was a good graph that Sharina had to show us those different time periods and how long that those time periods lasted before they went into something else something else something else so it's really good to take a bird's eye view of like from uh, genesis 1 1 and revelation 22 21 and see how everything just sort of fits together and uh, it's amazing. It's like one big puzzle. And we're right smack dab in the middle of it. We're all a part of it. So. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We'll just close out and uh, we will see you on Sunday. Father, we just thank you for using your people, Lord God, to help uh, not only the, themselves grow, but uh, us to grow as well. Thank you for the knowledge that we attained tonight. Thank you for um, the clarity of your word uh, that was given by uh, these two wonderful ladies of God. Thank you, Father God, for their growth. I, I know and have seen both of them as a very young babes in the Lord, and now they are just the strongest people we know. And I just thank you for them, Lord God. Continue to strengthen strengthen them as well as us in Jesus name. Thank you again for everyone who was able to come out tonight to uh, be with us and uh, bring as many back as possible on Sunday uh, for some more good word. And we'll be careful to give you all of the praise, honor, and the glory in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Amen. So, Thank you. In, in recording. Yeah. Oh, okay. Amen. Amen. Uh -huh. God bless everyone. Did I hear who was that? Was that 